And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a, re I have a returning pair of one good brother and one good sister. The double-headed monster that is Thirteenth Moon Games in the red in the red corner we ha we have Roach and in the blue and in the blue corner we ha we have Stephen. Now previously in the temple with Coven and Crucible, now coming back with its first proper expansion with Unbound. How you two doing tonight? Aside from freezing, because oh. everybody's freezing. Yeah, it's very cold. Hello. <laughs> hello, hello. Hello. I'm not going to do the lights out gag, because I already did that. <laughs> uh, I want to see if I can... Get, I want to see how low I can get my voice until, I'm, until I eventually start sounding like Vincent Price or something. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I was on a podcast the other day, and s somebody in the comments said that I sound like Bruce Campbell, which is flattering, I suppose. I can see it. I'm yeah, not, yeah. I'm not chopping my arm off. No. <laughs> I don't think you have to go that far. No. No, though, um, there, though there is a... There is there is a last chance theater near nearby where I live that every Halloween plays all three Evil Dead movies. Oh, Outstanding. Nice. Uh, midway through they'll do intermission with um f with trailers from around the from around the time because sitting through three movies would be a bit much. Uh, back to that back. That is a lot. Uh, yeah, that is a lot. Yeah. And they they do they do similar weird things like say midnight showings of Rocky Horror or The Room. Um, I think at one at one of those kind of midnight showings, I got to meet Tommy Wiseau, and he is he is exactly how he is everywhere else. Nice. Also kept also kept making basketball remarks at my expense. I think it's because tall guy. I imagine. You know, because I'm six six, so. By law of averages, most people are short to me. I'm five out. one, and <laughs> I'm five one, and I'm short because I'm scared of heights, so I stay close to the ground. Well, us usually it means that somebody's going to come up to me at work and s and say, "Hey, can you get this thing off the top shelf for me?" And then I say <laughs> yes and continue working. <laughs> and if. And if you've seen this gag before, you know exactly where they went wrong. <laughs> yes. Because they asked me if I could do it. They didn't ask me if, if I would. And technically speaking, I could get it off the top shelf. I just didn't <laughs> want to. <laughs> <laughs> but... Last, now, last time I had you on... Covenant Crucible was on the cusp of coming out. I do I do remember there was the draft version, then the fi then the final version. So, was uh, was the material for Unbound something that you already had already had in mind, or were the ideas things that percolated after you had finished the core book? Um. All of the stuff that's in Unbound is uh, came out after the core book uh, because we have, when we were working on it previously on the core book, we were running a play test and we continued running that play test after the core book because we were having a lot of fun with it. And as we were running this play test, we ended up with uh, the players in our um, in our game are they have. Uh, a ton of XP now. Uh, Stefan knows more than I do about how much XP they have, but they have really high-level characters, and we found ourselves having to um, kind of come up with new uh, 
lore and new monsters and scenarios for these higher level characters and we thought oh we should probably do an expansion not only if we're with the lore but also to take into account that if you have people who've been playing the game for a year or so that they're going to have quickly um gotten to the point where they need higher level um encounters and material to work with We also worked on, because um, we had mentioned some of the things in the core book, things like the planes of existence, uh, stuff like that. And so what we did in, the, in Unbound and what we're doing in Unbound is we are fleshing those out, expanding upon those, having uh, denizens uh, local just to those planes of existence and uh, rules on how to get there and, and what happens when you are there uh, and what can happen to you uh, if you tried to do too much. Um, so it's a it's a lot of uh, a lot of lore that was put into that, and some mechanics too, new mechanics, um, planar travel, um, you know, pocket dimension, astral projection, all of that stuff um, gets put uh, it was put and expanded on in Unbound. So it was, it's it's kind of like Roach said, we we were running this wonderful play test with all these awesome people, and they just kept building and building and kept trying to break the rules as we made them. Uh, and so then we realized we needed to expand uh, on some of this stuff. And that's exactly what we did. Mm -hmm. Now, with that now with that in mind, uh, when it let I'd like to go into some of the things kind of just bullet points. Oh, sure. The first, th the first thing to go with is the fact that there's a bunch of new houses that are being um, added. There's or there's already a fair few houses within the co within the core book as is. So I'd kind of like to go into some into some of them because obviously going into all all thirteen would be a little bit much for one for one <laughs> interview. It take up the whole time. Absolutely. <laughs> So, you know, just, just let's just go with a greatest hits, as it were. Um. Yeah. So the original, the core book had nine houses, and uh, we and uh, this in Unbound, we're expanding, we're adding thirteen more. Uh, we decided we wanted to explore houses that are not part of the coven, which is the umbrella corporate. Uh, corporation uh, in the world uh, of witches. And so we have things like we have a monster hunting house where uh, the witches who are part of that house go around and deal with dragons and hydras and planar worms and all of these uh, various magical creatures that we have in the world. Um, we created witch type houses. So there are witches who uh, get. Uh, their, who fuel their magic from storms or from the sea, um, stuff like that. So we wanted to just explore more of this world and um, figure out where all these other witches are who might not be part of the original nine houses that we put together in the core book. Mm -hmm. uh, and each of those uh, additional houses have their own traits. Um, some of them, uh, whereas like the main nine, uh, I don't want to give too much away, but with the main nine core houses, uh, the coven houses, um, they each have three house traits. Um, these, uh, a lot of them are based around concepts. Uh, and I, and so they would, uh, the house trait, there's only one house trait, but it kind of relates to, um, the theme of that house as it were. So, like the storm witches, their uh, their house trait has to do with storms. Um, there's all sorts of different uh, pretty cool houses, like the Lovelace House, um, where they're uh, all about the internet, and so um, their house trait deals with, of course, computers, technology, and the internet. So, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So with with that in mind, when 
since you mentioned one that's all about monster hunting, is it treated like a hunting lodge in terms of how they operate, or is there a different approach? Um, so with the Monster Hunter house, uh, the idea behind that is they are um, kind of part Steve Irwin, part Big Game Hunter, mm -hmm. uh, where their primary goal is uh, basically if a dragon comes and is terrorizing uh, a city or if they need to clear out a space from a hydra that has taken up um, residence, stuff like that, that they're the ones who are called in. So they're almost kind of like animal control, but they have this other side to them where they don't just relocate. They will go and uh, hunt down act the monsters who continue to threaten humanity. Um, the idea is that uh, they have a um, respect for these creatures, but also understand that sometimes the creatures need to be taken care of. And that extends to not only just magical creatures, but supernatural beings. So if there is a werewolf that is, say, terrorizing a uh, a neighborhood, or if there's a vampire who is being... Uh, Un not very selective or very good about their feeding habits, that then they will come in and take care of that. Mm -hmm. So with, the, with that said, each, each house tends to have its own focuses and its own um, benefits. And I'm guessing that, that, that that's still... That's still applicable. Their own, their own um, trait benefits, as it were. I'm guessing Correct. with the new one, that's the the new ones. That's still as applicable. Oh yeah, absolutely. The uh, the mechanics behind it are um, that the only difference between um, the benefits that were received from the core houses and the benefits received from um, these concept houses is that there's only one house trait for these. Uh, I you know I can say smaller houses. Because they're not they're they're not mainstream. They're smaller branches. They don't have a large number of members, um, things like that. So you, these with these smaller houses, they are uh, they they only have one house trait. That house trait is um, while it's only applicable under certain circumstances, the benefit is um, really almost just as good as having three house traits from the core book but because it's only applicable under certain cir circumstances or situations it's not as utility there's no, it's not as utilitarian is what i'm trying to say mm -hmm. yeah we put a lot of effort i mean a lot of our back and forth when we're working on this is coming up with uh game balance where a lot of the times i'll come up with an idea and i go to stefan who's the mechanics guy and say does this make sense or is this balanced is this too overpowered and th that sort of thing so it's you know with these new houses when we're coming up with the trait it's not just uh coming up with something that's balanced but coming up with something that we haven't done before because we don't want this to be a repeat repeat of uh territory that we've already covered um that's then that's you know what's the point of having an expansion then if you're just doing the same thing over and over And, well, we know the definition of insanity. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, and that's that was one of the things, too, is we wanted to have something that was different, that stood out, that, that you know, made these houses kind of uh, appealing. Because, um, you know, you have the, the nine core houses. People can find places there, or, or there are independent witches, which is the majority of witches. Uh, in the world of Covenant Crucible, the majority of them are independent, which is don't belong to a house or even the Covenant. So um, getting these houses where there's a, a trait that really resonates with that house, um, I think was really important. And so we went back and forth because originally we had three traits just like the other ones. We're like, let's let's do something a little different. And so uh, and it got me excited because, you know, I'm a mechanic guy. I love mechanics. And so we talked about it. And we you know, brainstormed and hashed it out and came up with this other idea of um, circumstantial. 
really would be a good definition for the, some of these traits that apply only during certain circumstances, but their benefit, their benefit is greater than just one single house trait. So it was pretty cool. I, I'm super stoked about it. And people, uh, the people I've talked to, uh, are really, really super excited about, like, of course, I mentioned techno witches, and that just like people lost it over that. They love it. They love the idea of techno witches, you know, and astral projecting into the internet, which is a whole different plane of existence, which is pretty cool. So, you know, a whole lot of new stuff coming in Unbound. I'm pretty excited. Brave new forms of trolling, and well, let's, let's, hope, it, <laughs> let's hope it doesn't, let's hope it doesn't end up like the, um, like some of the techno magic that was in, that was in Mage, though. Then, though, I'd say Covenant Crucible is more balanced than Mage. Yeah, it's. it's oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. The um the the mechanic. I mean, it's it's a learning curve. Um, uh, you know, it it's it can be daunting at first, um, especially given the uh, versatility of uh, the D twelve system in the the way we've got it set up for, um accomplishing tasks but uh certainly it's not mage the accounting i mean <laughs> it's you know once once you get your target number you can write that target number down and it's usually usually never changes so the only way thing you have to do with it is apply some modifier to it and so that's that's the, once you know what you're doing and you have all your your actions kind of jotted down of what your uh target number is that's it. Then all you got to do is roll those 2d12 and see if you can get underneath that target number and then mm -hmm. move on to the next thing. Yeah, and of course, I'm always I'm always happy to see the lonely d12 actually get some love, but <laughs> Right? Other... I know. Like I've mentioned this before, but I've had this sketch in um in the back of my mind and I just I just needs I need to find some to find the right person to do the voiceover cuz I um I have too deep of a voice to do to do it myself, and that that is a parody of of those um of the of those those sad ads I saw as a kid, just just with just the whole for seven cents a day you can you can adopt a D twelve so it gets a loving home, <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> it's true they don't get a lot of love um. And Stefan was the one who came up with the D12 system. Again, uh, when we first, if people weren't around for the first time we talked with you, uh, the whole idea of this game came about when um, I I wanted to I wanted to run a game for Stefan. Stefan is always uh, the he's the all the forever DM. He is always the one who's running the games, and uh, I wanted to run a game for him, but I didn't know any of the systems well enough to run a game, uh, any of the, the systems that we've done, we've played in before. And also, I had had, you know, had inspiration over the years, you know, from various movies, uh, John Wick and The Last Witch Hunter and Leverage and, and other uh, places that I want. I was like, I want to run or create a tabletop gaming system uh, with my husband. And... Um, he was the one, and I was like, I have no idea about mechanics. I'm the lore person. I'm the world builder. And Stefan is the one who's like D12s. Mm -hmm. That's what we're gonna do, and we're gonna we're gonna give them some love. And uh, I am just always been in awe of his ability to put the mechanics together and to come up with a system that, while it has a bit of a learning curve, once you've gotten it, um, it goes really fast and sim and easy. Uh, the rolling doesn't take that long. It's uh, you roll under the your target number, and it's a game that you can play. That all you need is two dice for. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, I, there's a couple questions I had I had in mind regarding the expansions for houses. The first of which is, whenever you're doing expansions there's always the temp there's always the issue that can come up of power creep you know of newer stuff being more useful than older stuff um is there a guideline that you guys had set up to make to make sure that that issue is at the very least minimized absolutely uh i mean we didn't have a guideline so much as we both chatted and said we wanted them 
um, you know, to be, uh, you know, not just a repeat. Because we had them originally, we wrote them down, we had them originally, and, and we're like, it just felt like it was just repeating to the houses. And it was, nothing was overpowered. Um, uh, but in, and so we, we had a discussion and we worked through it. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, the house traits uh, for these concept houses, there's only one per house, like we said. Um, yeah, whereas in the core book, there's the three. And usually how the house traits work are the first house trait gives you a, uh, a bonus to uh, an attribute. Um, so whenever you're rolling something, for instance, let's say uh, the Merlins, if you're a Merlin, you're, whenever you make a roll, you're rolling something that adds, with your real attribute, it adds um, you know, one per level of the trait to the target number. And then at level three, it adds one to your level of success which is how well you succeed. Um, so if you were to say, and then of course there's a, the, the second house trait is, deals with a skill, um, you know, something like martial or magical or something like that. And then the, the third one deals with the specific sub skill that is the, uh, one of the house foci. So um, if you were to do something, if you're a member of that house and you were to do something that had um, that, attribute that skill and that sub skill uh then you'd be doing really really well if you had all three house traits because you get to add if you had levels house traits at level three you get to add nine to your target number and three to your levels of success which is pretty cool these concept houses that are going to be in the unbound expansion they they have their one trait um again like i said is circumstantial so like a storm witch if they're outside during a storm their magic is anything involving their magical skill is increased uh, and they get a plus three to their target number and to their levels of success, but it's only when they're outside during a storm. Uh, so like when they're exposed to that storm. Uh, so while that one trait may seem like it's super powerful because it's adding three to your level of success, that's amazing. Well, uh, but it only applies under certain circumstances. And you'd get a similar benefit if you had all three house traits, but you get more because um, you're uh, applying all three traits to that same role as opposed to just the one from the house, the concept house. So uh, the, as far as the power creep factor, is there something new that's going to be overpowered? Eh, I don't think so. Um, I think these are pretty well balanced. Uh, I think when, but it does, like I said, introduce some of the new things like the techno witch house. Um, they're obviously very focused on computers and technology, and so their house trade is revolving around that, which makes it easier for them to, you know, plan or travel into the internet, which is going to be huge. So it that may seem because it's new, mm -hmm. that may seem pretty powerful, but in the grand scheme of things, we've also created these planes. There are dangerous places that you ne don't necessarily want to go to. So it's exciting and new, and people are going to want to try it. And then then the RC is going to go, okay, cool. Well, here's a here's a planar worm. And you're like, oh, man, what's this? And then you get devoured and make a new character. No, not, not, not that deadly. But they are, you know, there's there's things that you need to be cautious about. And it's gonna it's it's gonna be really interesting. I'm really looking forward to hearing some of the feedback of people who play it and use it and uh, introduce it to their current Crucible game. Yeah, mm -hmm. and also, I mean, with the idea of power creep, these expansions, uh, like the original nine houses, um, a lot of the expansion is lore and background, uh, adding in NPCs that uh, storytellers can use in their game, adding in um, some magic items or uh, some. Um, Materia Magica that is specific to those houses. So it's not necessarily that these expansions are adding um, specifically new mechanics or new powers, but more delving deeply more into the world building behind it so that people who go, I'm going, I want to be part of this house, like part of the Magi, for example, uh, and what does that mean? What Give me more background so that I can... Uh, prep my character and have my character be immersed into this house. So it, uh, the power creep, I feel like we built a pretty good foundation for how 
new traits are uh, put in and um, uh, installed in this system. And it's just a matter of us keeping to those guidelines, I think, have really kept it so that it's still very, uh, very balanced uh, while still giving people new stuff that they can look forward to and play around with. Now, earlier it's it sounded like that that um a good chunk of a good chunk of this was built for people who had progress progressed a little further on with the development of their parties. Is that what is that one of the goals with Unbound to kind of support high, for lack of a better term, high level play? I say for lack of a better <laughs> term because this isn't a game with levels, but I have to tr I have to I. I have to try and be succinct with it. Oh, absolutely. Um, I get what you're saying. It's, it's, it has material for new characters as well. Uh, but yeah, part of the focus and part of the impetus for this expansion is that um, here the, your character has been playing for a year, two years. Uh, they have, you know, 300 experience points on their sheet, which is tremendously, uh, you know, heavy when it comes to comparing it to a witch fresh out of the book um so uh yeah that is there's there's there is some of that we are including a ton of new traits so that um even starting characters can have uh if they're specialized enough can have a really strong edge uh you know in certain circumstances but again you know the, 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 the game was designed that you create a specialist because you're going to be working with a team or a group or what we call a circle of mm -hmm. witches. Or, and it doesn't have to be witches. I mean, you can have players. We have one of our playtest players who does not play a spellcaster or play a witch, which is awesome. Um, and uh, so it's there is that. But it's, you know, you're, you're specialized uh, as a character. And then as you progress... You know, you start to branch out, and as your character develops, you start to branch out because you're encountering things and experiencing things and finding things that your character wants to go and do. Um, and then once you get past a year's worth of experience, I we created um, what's called combination traits. So when you have a character who is the master of uh, a, a few sub skills under the magical skill, so like let's say um, hexing and warding. You know they've reached their they've capped out of their on their levels of skill and that sub skill. So like let's say they have a seven in hexing and a seven in warding, um, and they have over accumulated over 130 experience points, which is a year over a year. It's only ten months, but um, they can then purchase these combination traits, which is basically special abilities that they've uh, learned uh, because they they have mastered both of those sub skills. Um, that gives them certain benefits as well. So, um, whole new, a whole bunch of new stuff. Plus, concept traits um, where you know you have somebody who's a hacker that's reflected in their skill, skills and sub skills. But also, you take the trait and it adds again some more uh, ability to your character. Whereas it's like a adds to your target number and to your levels of success. So that means that's what you really specialize and focus in. So it helps. It helps get folks really, really focused and specialized into what they want their character to do. And then you can grow from there as you gain experience points. If that makes sense. So with that in with that in mind, since we've kind of we've kind of dabbled around it, da danced around it, what it what have you, let's talk let's talk about the about the fact that the internet is treated as a plane of existence. Now now with now with the expansion um, present in in Unbound. Oh yeah, it's um, there. That was one of the things that I uh, wanted from pretty much the get go when we first started talking about planes of existence. That the internet would be one of those. Uh, that you have um, this space where uh, not only does technology happen, but you can also work magic in it. And um, I'm. A witch myself so I uh, 
put a lot of my own um, understanding of how magic works into the game system. And one of those is you have a lot of uh, witches who, that's what they do, is they uh, use technology in their magic. And so for me, it was just, it just made sense to expand that in the game and to say, this is a plane of existence, this is some place that you can uh, plane or travel to, uh, where you it has its own um, Denzians and, uh, for lack of a better term, magical creatures. It has its own uh, pitfalls and dangers, but there's also rewards to going there. And um, we have had a lot of people who've expressed interest in this idea of internet witches and techno witches. And I'm really excited to see what people do with that. And where they go with it. Yeah. Yeah. As far as the, and as far as the internet goes, we've with all the planes that we define that we expand on in Unbound, we have detailed um, how to get there and what things are like. For instance, like mechanics of traveling to the internet, like astral projecting into the internet, so to speak. Um, so, you know, things function differently. And how do they function? And so we give a run and a basic rundown of these are how things work. Like does science work? Does time work normally? Does um, how does magic work in the internet? How does or, or in any of the other planes as well? Um, so uh, you know we've given them a lot of material to just start. And I, I can see that if this really takes off, then um, you know creating another more detailed expansion for each of the planes or or one whole expansion for all the uh, planes and things like that because it's uh, it's again we touched on them in the core book we're expanding on them here in unbound uh, but it is no by no means definitive mm -hmm. uh, so you know it can become really really huge and uh, and it all depends on what the STs and what the players come up with and, and how they take their game and how they tell their stories which is really super exciting to me I'd love to just sit around and hear about it great <laughs> And I'd imagine part of the reason why, why a lot of people are going to have an interest in this ties into a bit of a, a bit of a myth when it comes to when it, com when it comes to how when it comes to how fantasy is viewed. You know, this idea that there's some great wall of China between the fantastical and technology. Uh and and it's definitely something that some that some games have um, encouraged. What whether it be having it, whether it be the supernatural and the technological having an adversary relationship with each other, and that's kind of been seen as the standard. But the but the question really the question that should be asked is why is that the case? Why can't why can't the two why can't the two co-mingle oh yeah and i think that that's um a really fair question and yeah there has been a whole lot of you you know ew, you got your your science fiction in my fantasy oh you got your fantasy in my science fiction um whereas with covenant crucible we specifically wanted to make it that it is magic in a modern setting and you still have you know taxis and uh computers and coffee bars and all of that but you also have the magic part of it so you'll have um you know people who use their magic to help them be better hackers or people who use their magic to be better uh drivers stunt drivers or whatever um we have uh, in our world this um it's a franchise coffee place called magic beans where not only can you get just mundane coffee but you can get mon coffee with an alchemical shot um i really wanted to show a world where the magic and the technological can coexist and uh work with each other and it's just uh that science and magic just are two different um ways to accomplish something not that they have that adversarial or that one cancels out the other or you know one uh can't exist with the other mm -hmm. oh. yeah 
exactly that and just to go off on that too is um that magic is a learned skill just like science just like computers just like technology uh and so it's you know it, if you have somebody who is uh and in fact there's a house in the core book and um you know we mentioned it uh and we have the house here in the expansion um that focuses on uh magic and technology or magic and science um they had a really great scenario where they you know 3d printed a uh using magic and a uh and technology combined 3d printed a uh a body essentially for an ai who was a ghost to then uh in, inhabit and it was it just it was amazing that they all just came up with this and it was super super cool so mm -hmm. and whenever whenever people try and do that whole great wall between magic and tech i always i always say nobody tell them about star wars <laughs> right <laughs> Nobody tell them about Star exactly. Wars. Nobody tell them about Dune or any of the myriad um, pulp SF works that str that straddled that line, especially in like the 1950s. You know, before the before <laughs> the advent of what my friend, my dear friend, calls large men with screwdrivers. <laughs> but. Something I've always found I've found amusing when it comes to this dichotomy is, as the Star I joke about Star Wars with this, but the but it's one of those things where you're supposedly not supposed to put um, that put them together until it until it's magically convenient because no one's gonna art because if I the reason I bring up Star Wars and that kind of thing is because it's going to automatically put someone who has that separatist attitude on the defensive. Yeah. But there's Yeah, I can one... see that. I I I hate the fact that I'm referencing a Marvel movie with this, but there's one line <laughs> in the first Thor movie that is apropos. Your ancestors called it science. No, sorry, your ancestors called it magic. Now you call now you call it magic. I come from a world where they're one and the same. Mhm. Mm yep. And given how given how both are are about the are about the understanding of the world ar around around one, um, it makes it makes perfect sense to attempt to combine them, especially since I remember I remember <coughs> um, going through Unearthed Arcana <laughs> way way back in the early two thousands, and. <laughs> It hinting at the idea of a of a mage using a PDA as an equivalent to a spell book. Now, That's obviously, awesome. Obviously, PDAs have fallen out have fallen out of favor, but in its in its defense, this was like two thousand three. So, <laughs> but that that particular idea why. And it brings up the question: Why should why should a mage in the in a more modern setup keep his spells in the in the same style of dusty tome as a mage from three hundred years ago? Oh yeah, totally. And that's one of the things that um, again to draw off of my uh, experience outside of the game as a pagan and witch that you have that idea of having uh, electronic grimoires and books of shadows. And so why wouldn't you have that in a fantasy setting, in a setting where you have magic and technology? Why wouldn't you have, you know, wiki pages where um, you uh, keep spells and people could come in and say, you know, oh, this spell didn't work. Uh, try substituting this ingredient or this materia magica and stuff like that. Um, all of this is already happening in our world. Uh, why is it so unbelievable to have it happening in a fantasy RPG? Mm -hmm. uh, I've come to the conclusion that, that in a lot of cases when there's that friction, it has more to do with someone's 
for lack of a better term, security blanket, to the point where I've called them Linus without the piano skills. <laughs> uh, but within now with within some of the within some of the expanded lore of the original nine houses, um, is some of is some of that lore expansion dedicated to the relationships that the houses have with each other? Absolutely. Uh, there is absolutely uh, a exploration of um, not only of, you know, how they get along with each other, uh, who doesn't like who, who doesn't trust who. Um, the, there's uh, also uh, information on rumors that swirl around each house. Um, it's really just a we want to give people more information more lore uh more world building so that they can uh have their characters interact with these houses with the npcs and with each other uh with a good grounding background behind it i mean in the core book the um uh the original nine houses, they only have a couple paragraphs associated with them, whereas in the expansion, we have pages. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it's important to na it's important to nail down who's who's likely to work with each other, who's likely to screw each other over, and who's and who, not only who has a shoot on sight policy, but who has a shoot them twice policy. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Oh. And if it if it sounds if it sounds like I'm pre I'm prepping for somebody's campaign to have a Mexican standoff between the players, well, if I'm gonna steal, I may as well steal from the best. Because <laughs> some people would say that that it'd be ridiculous to have a bunch of mages doing a OK Corral shootout. I would say not at all. <laughs> I would say what I would say why not? Especially right, that's a. That's exactly what this system is designed to do. Um, you have witches who are adept at uh, ranged combat. You have witches who can who keep themselves safe, who block incoming attacks by shooting them out of the air. You know, you have all of that, which is amazing. Uh, that's what this is for. It's it's it's, it, it's got all the grit and the cinem cinematography cinematography of like a John Wick movie. With the added cool benefit of magic and lore from the last witch hunter, but it's not yeah. using those worlds; it's inspired by. So does that mean I can't? Does that mean I can't bring in the sommelier from from chapter two into this world or something? You absolutely, oh, you absolutely can, can do that. <laughs> it's um, a forger. This... That, that person's a for, uh, forge master. That person would be someone who creates magic items just for specifically for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just. I'd pref I've always interpreted that that particular forge master and it be t given that forges are are so often associated with dwarves or the more surly types of builders having one who is just completely professional about the whole thing is a ch is a nice change of pace <laughs> Absolutely I mean I've I've made I've made no bones that one of my favorite scenes from chapter two was ju was just the was just Wick getting all of the gear for the for his assignment, and all of the euf all the euphemism regarding regarding both regarding both t a tailor and a wine tasting. Exactly. Yep. Now. Yeah. Oh, good. I was going to say, I mean, and, and uh, forge masters, they can be, uh, you know, while we use forging as the, the form of the subskill or the dis description of the subskill, it doesn't necessarily use a forge uh, because you can enchant mundane items. You don't have to actually create uh, an item itself, but you absolutely can, and a lot of people do. Uh, like we have well, one of the play testers is uh, uh, playing an Amish. Forge Master, which is absolutely awesome, mm -hmm. uh, and we have uh, people who have contacts um, who are uh, like black market arms dealers that are Forge Masters, which is really really cool. So you've, I mean, you got you could be anything. 
you know, anything that your mind can come up with as far as what you want to compare it to or what you want to become, you can do that with the system. Mm -hmm. And well, do you know what, do you know what goes clop, clop, bang, bang, clop, clop? Uh, I'm interested to hear. Amish drive by. I have no shooting. idea. Oh. Okay. Oh. I should have seen that one coming. Yeah. Yes, you should have. <laughs> Me too. Yes, you should. You should have seen that one coming. Or at least heard it. Pro <laughs> This is a good possibility of a definite maybe. Then, ag then again, I never, I never, I have never claimed to be extremely professional in in this temple. Nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Not at all. But what? Given given the given the um, internet asso association, I'm guessing that one of the analogies that's used is that is that. Um, magic through that is treated not as not that far removed from the way programming is. You know, where everything has to be very specific, and if one thing's out of alignment, the whole thing goes, for lack of a better word, tits up. Um. Yeah. Well, the magic system in Covenant Crucible is all about intent. Mm -hmm. So yes, you have to be specific about what it is that you are attempting to do uh and we do that um we put it that way because again we want people to because we don't have like spell slots or uh spell spells that people can choose from to to do uh we want people to think about how their characters would approach magic and how they would use it so like we have you, you could have a character who is a news reporter, and her hexing, when she hexes someone, it comes out looking like a news cryon. Or you have, like, the, um, you have one who is, uh, from, like, the fairy house and is this fae, uh, witch who, when she casts her magic, it's all glittery and like that. Um, and so, yeah, like with programming, you have to be specific about uh, what it is that you're doing, how, what your, what effect you are intending for it to for it to happen, um, so that the ST can then say, okay, this is what you intended. Now we're going to do our roles. We're going to see if you succeed or not, and then we can return to the story and. Uh, go over what actually happens. It's it's all about um, player and intent, and play and it gets players thinking about things as opposed to okay, I'm just casting a spell. Hmm. Well, what does that look like? What is the intent behind it? What are you wanting it to achieve? Yeah, I always I always call back I always call back to. The incident, the incident where somebody miswrote "monster" on, on their summon monster um, spell, and instead they end up summoning a block of cheese, you know, summon monster. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that's in the um, in the game system as well. Like if you're summoning a demon, there the idea is that you have to like know their names so that you are summoning the the demon that you are actually trying to summon. Uh, and if you don't do it right. Uh, does that mean um, it doesn't work at all, or do you end up with a demon that you were not expecting to summon, and now you're stuck with uh, a completely different experience than what you thought you were going to get? Mm -hmm. It could, it could be, it, it could be either or. Uh, yeah, I'd say, I'd say. Oh. And we leave that up to that. That again, because this is a game of cooperative storytelling. It's it's much more about the story than the roles. Um, that then it's up to the storyteller and to the players to decide how that looks. Mm -hmm. And as far as how that relates to the internet, um, you know, the, as far as the internet being a plane of existence in this world and in, in the expansion. Um, 
you know, magic does function differently inside the internet uh, than it functions to, uh, outside, um, only because the internet is uh, a vastly different space and things happen so very, very quickly. Um, durations are much, much shorter. They're measured in seconds instead of minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, then a lot of there's a lot of internet specific traits and traits that are uh, really focused on that um, plane and the people that work with that plane. And so, of course, they all have those kind of connotations of like that involve coding or things like that. Like a, there's a trait called dedicated server. There's a trait uh, called daemon coder. Uh, there's you know so there's some things that are in there, that, and it's all very geared toward that technological aspect of it but um but yeah it and we tried to do that to give it some different flavor and a sense of um dangerous urgency mm -hmm. yeah i can i can certainly get behind that now with that in with that in mind the the original the original core book for Covenant Crucible charted up at about 191 pages. Uh, what do you see the page count going going for for um, Unbound? Uh, it's going to be probably slightly longer. Um, the amount of because we have it, it's pretty much it's 95 percent written. Um, where we've got some expansion, uh, some stretch goals that if we hit, there's going to be more, it's going to be a higher page count. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, we're intending on it to be a 200 page book. Um, it's going to have much more content than the core book had just because we're expanding on so much stuff and we've added, uh, so much more and then you'll have even more of that if we hit our two big stretch goals which are the um international where we'll be including international sites and settings and then the um we've have a system in place for playing uh shifters like werewolves werebears whatever um vampires uh demon spawn uh fairyborn that sort of thing um, and that'll add to the page count as well, but that'll be only if we hit those two stretch goals. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and to make sure that I don't um, tempt the gods of irony, knocking on wood. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Look, you, you know how there's the saying, "There's no, there are no atheists in foxholes." Yes, I think the I think a similar saying can apply to no to um no atheists at the gaming table. Yes, there's there's always somebody that you are uh, sending a quick little prayer to before you roll that die. Well, because well because of my nickname of being the monk, everybody er, whenever I GM, everybody expects me to bless their dice. <laughs> oh, because. <laughs> And if that sounds odd, well, remember, monks would sometimes have to double as priests. Oh, yeah. Usually because there weren't any priests on hand, but, you know, you play the hand you're dealt in that, in that case. Or you have that one person who the universe just really, 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 really is out to get. <laughs> you know, the one who, no matter what, always ends up botching roles except when they don't need to. Yeah. Yeah, I know that. I know that that feeling to or the, or the whole thing of no of nobody touches anybody else's dice. So there's no there's no shortage of superstitions. I'll, I'll I've had I've had the rule of if it do, if it rolls off the table it doesn't count. Yeah, we have that too. Uh, that and every that and BYOD. You know, bring your own dice. Yep, dice. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because well, one one person ended up ended up um borrowing a and a borrowing a die. First roll, first roll of the night, botch. Thirty minutes later, they try again. They try again with another roll, botch. 
after after demanding that dice back and swapping it out with a different one, they roll again. Botch. After yep. <laughs> after which I immediately I immediately stopped pl I immediately stopped play and and was like, okay, one of you is rolling for this person because they are clearly cursed. <laughs> And I and I do not have time to hire an exorcist. But <laughs> it's. But with with that said, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? I know that that can be a bit tricky when it comes to stretch goals. But um, what would you be shooting for as far as a ballpark of, in that sense? We are looking at uh, July of this year for releasing it. Um, our last Kickstarter, when we did the core book, we gave a release date of March after the ending of the um, ending of our Kickstarter in January, and we were able to hit that goal. We had the book out and uh, two people by the end of March. Um, we don't. We anticipate that we're going to have uh, the same. Be able to keep to the same kind of schedule this time around. Uh, again, we have 95% of the book written. The big one is the international uh, setting because we'll be bringing in um, some people to help us with that aspect of it. Uh, and um, yeah, we're by July of this year. We'll have the uh, Unbound ready so that people can have it in their hands and they can start playing with it. Mm -hmm. And I will certainly be looking forward to it. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy <laughs> the madness that happens here. Thank you so much for having us. It was awesome. Thank you. Yes, this was a great talk. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!